Oh, there I am. It has me. Hello. So I have a, oh, there we go. So I had a slide deck here that I was hoping, uh, rather than a title, I have a little tree because I had trouble putting a title on this. But what I want to talk about today is the forces and what happens as a system grows. So we have, you know, everyone here, okay, hold on, I'm going to do a quick show of hands. Who here actually builds stuff for the web? Fabulous. That's almost everybody. I didn't see any hands not go up, except, I don't know, I'll, I'm breathing on this. Let me see if I can adjust it. Okay. So we all build things on the web. We hear many things about what we should do and how we should do it. You know, we need to, you know, build it to be able to scale in case you suddenly get hit by everyone on the internet. But you also need to iterate on features really fast. And a whole lot of these things actually contradict each other. You know, what is the right thing to do? You know, when is the right thing to do it? Why is it the right reason to do it when you do? And that's what I want to talk about is the forces at different points in time that make different things the very right or the very wrong things to do. So the context in which we're going to talk about this is, well, this doesn't look too bad. So we're going to start with a little company because that's the easiest one that I know with a product that is in some market. And they don't know exactly what the product is yet. They don't know exactly what the market is yet. They're trying to figure it out. So in the beginning, there's typically nothing. You have a blank slate, you know. And so the pressures on you are really easy to work with. You know, you need to add features until you have something. And the way that we're basically going to, you know, think about this, a very simplified model for development for web stuff, there's two main pieces of work. There's adding features, and there's removing scaling limits. You don't add scalability. You get rid of problems that keep you from scaling. And then given everything else that's happening around you, one of these things or some combination of this is going to make a whole lot of sense. Um, in other cases, it won't. So in the beginning, almost everything starts out looking like this. Um, you know, you've got Rails. You have two instances for availability, although you're probably running somewhere that'll manage that for you. And you have a database. And everyone starts like this because it is the fastest way to go from zero to something. You know, and it may not be Rails, it might be Django, it might be Flask, it might be Express, it might be Play. But when you want to, you know, when you don't know what your product is yet, when you don't know what your market is yet, when you don't really know what you're doing yet, other than I have this great idea, the world really needs another list of gifts that I want for Christmas. And it needs to use my Facebook friends to figure out what to give me or something like that. Everyone starts this way. And this is ideal. Because you take something that is right out of the gate, really productive, you know about. Um, people have used it for similar things. And you can iterate on what makes you special very, very quickly. Everyone looks blank. I realize I'm speaking English quickly. Am I speaking too quickly? Fabulous. You all speak much better English than I do Polish. Um, yes, I got a chuckle. OK. so. The next step, you know, we talked about the technical side. In the beginning, it's really easy. Everyone, hopefully, knows how to use their preferred web framework. And deploying it nowadays is equally easy. You take someone who handles all the operational stuff for you, and you say, great, I'm going to focus on my product. You know, so typically, this is Heroku. It might be App Engine. It might be Beanstalk. Uh, it might be .cloud. It might be you know, one of these other people. But in the beginning, what you need to do is focus on your features and nothing else because it doesn't matter yet. Unless you have people using your thing, unless you have people uh, ideally paying you so you can stay in business, but there's other ways to stay in business, largely taking VCs money instead of customers. Um, this doesn't matter. So you don't want to focus anything operationally. All you want to do is build features. And so the sort of bare point is you Heroku push your thing up and you have GitHub for source, some private account, you're managing nothing but your laptop and possibly email. You know, time goes by, you're iterating on features, you need a little bit more. But in the beginning, you're still going to be adding everything managed, everything hosted. You're not running any of this stuff yourself because anytime you're spending on systems administration, anytime you're spending spinning up servers or working on, you know, the availability of your email system is time absolutely wasted. And so you have your process by which you say, OK, look, yay, it works. Um, and again, time goes on, and you haven't figured out what's happening yet. 
And so you start adding a little bit more features, but you're still working completely within the bounds of established convention for the framework, the tools that you picked. And this is almost every single initial product. Someone should have disagreed with me by now, I'm getting worried. No one needs to reinvent a web server for their product? Come on, somebody has. Who's written a web server? Yes! You did and you failed? Oh, I'm sorry. You know, when you, when you make broad generalizations like this, you hope people are gonna disagree. Yes, yeah, so you, you did and you failed. Uh, we did and we replaced our web server with, you know, uh, Jetty, but. Um, so anyway, the typical one that keeps going, unfortunately, is one that works completely within the bounds because you don't want to waste you don't want to waste your time building new web frameworks, building new uh, sort of async job stuff. You know, you don't want to build a new database, a new web server. You want to focus on what differentiates you, so that you can iterate on your features fast. Because this is a interesting but somewhat stressful time because nobody cares about your thing yet. Nobody's heard about you. You know, maybe angel investors, or if you know you're doing something within an established organization, you know, you're sponsoring executives, know who you are, but no one else. And in a way, this is good. But you know, it's also we want to get something so people care quickly. And you're very small at this point. You know, you have an increasingly monolithic, you know, code base. You know, if you started with Rails, you know, I'll do a show of hands again. I'm trying to figure out. There's the light. Okay. You know, who tends to start with Rails today? No one, this is not a Rails crowd. Django. Okay, a few more Python folks. Uh, let's see, what else are the popular ones? Flask? No one uses Flask. Okay, so Django's in. Play, what do people here use? You need a new web app, what do you write it in? Scala? Play? Okay, what are people using? I'm curious, I figured everyone was still using Rails. I'm, I have a very California bias right now. Um, you know, where if you're in the valley, you use rail, or no, if you're in the valley, you use Django. If you're in San Francisco, you use Rails. Um, and it really is geographic like that. Because, you know, if you're in the valley, you used to work at Google, and so you like Python. And if you're in the city, you used to work at Twitter, and so you like Rails. And it's not quite that simple, but it's surprising. Okay, well, we'll come back to what other one was using. But you have that increasingly monolithic code base. Everything is in the one language. Everything's structured the same way. You know, maybe if you've done this before and you, you know, oh, we want to push some stuff out of the request res response request cycle, you know, you use something like Sidekick to do that. But it's still one big code base. And this is good because that's the fastest way to work when you're two people. And probably you're two people at this point. You have no technical operations capacity. You don't know what you're running on other than it's, you know, some Heroku dyno or it's whatever App Engine happens to run on or whatever you're doing. Maybe you went to EC2 first, but probably you didn't because it's just a little bit easier. Um, when things go wrong, usually you go down and then you deploy and you stay down and then you deploy again and maybe you came back up. And this is okay because you don't have any users yet. It doesn't really matter. You know, you have, 100,000 users, if you go down at three in the morning, it doesn't matter. So you do your deployments at night and nobody cares. And you know, it's not ideal. And here's the thing, everyone here is gonna say, oh, this is horrible, you need to do continuous deployment and have it all be automated and have Jenkins pushing things out, but you don't yet. If you spend time setting that up, you're spending time not working on features. And you don't have any users yet, so you're wasting your time. And this will change. But right now, that's the reality of it. And this can go on for a while. Most companies never get out of this. They never get traction, you know. The exit path from this sort of life stage of a product is you give up and if you raised angel money, you arrange it, you can, you have the connections, you arrange a talent acquisition and you go work at someone you wouldn't otherwise want to work for for a year and pay back your debts. If you don't have the connections to do that, you can say, oops, and you go work for someone you wouldn't otherwise work at while you figure out your next idea. Um, now, the other exit condition is you start growing. And now you go from iterating on features really fast to all of a sudden you can't stay up because it took off. This is the exit condition you want. And I call this the heroic age because all of those stories you hear about, you know, replacing a major component over the weekend, this is where they come from. Because now maybe you're three people or maybe you're five people 
And all of a sudden, all of these hacks that you did, all of these quick and dirty things in order to get features done fast, cause you to fall over at two in the afternoon instead of you know deploy and fall over at three in the morning. And everything you're doing now is trying to remove these scaling limits. And so we just sort of had a tectonic shift in the company. You go from, oh, how can we iterate on features faster? How can we iterate on features faster? How can we iterate on features faster? To, oh, my god, we have users. What do we do? You know. <laughs> There's a uh, absolutely wonderful talk, you know, I'm talking about talks at other conferences for a moment, that uh, the Pinterest folks did, where they talk about, oh, we went from nobody using us to doubling every two months. And that's not atypical. You know, Pinterest maintained that doubling two months longer than most people do. Um, but all of a sudden, you're growing and growing and growing and growing. And life just got hard because you have that code base that you have, and now you suddenly say, hmm, what fell over? Oh, we thought it was okay to store everything as a clob because we couldn't index it, but now we're falling over because of buffers in our database driver, you know, chewing up 70% of the CPU. You don't expect this. No one's like, oh, the database driver is the thing making us fall over. We thought it would be, you know, Apache doesn't scale, or, you know, MySQL loses data, but it doesn't anymore, but you know, people think these things. Um, and so things you can't predict, things you don't understand. And so you are just all of a sudden saying, okay, how do we fix this immediate problem? How do we get back up? Um, and the major changes that come in tend to be structural changes. So you have a huge period of change in your application, and you go from, you know, we have our monolithic Basil, or Basil, sorry. Um, see, I say Basil because that's our monolith at Ning. Um, you know, we started with something we called Basil. Uh, you have your monolithic Rails thing. Um, and now you start saying, well, it can't be this, you know, completely monolithic thing. You know, it needs to have a automatically sharding, you know, uh, NoSQL database that just fixes things. This is where I say that, you know, fabulous Pinterest talk, they go from, oh, you know, we have MySQL, well, let's add Cassandra, let's add um, Redis, React, Solar, Hadoop, all of these things, we read, a, uh, we read a white paper saying, oh, Cassandra, we add a server and we get increased capacity. I love it, it's magical. Or, oh, React, we add a server, we get increased capacity. Um, you still have five people and you have more database technologies than you do engineers sometimes. Um, because the thing that got you out of the problem last night doesn't get you out of the one tomorrow because you discover all kinds of problems and you're just scrambling as fast as you can to keep up with growth. And this is the right thing to be doing. This is absolutely the right thing to be doing at this point in time. You know, how do we, you know, Anyway, so some other things that happen during this time are you start saying, oh, wow, it turns out that um, we can't add dynos fast enough or deploy fast enough on Heroku. We need a little bit more control over what we're doing. You know, so the typical company, you know, product will shift over to AWS now, you know, EC2 or Rackspace or managed hosting, but something where they're starting to build their own operational capacity. Um, you know, you start saying, oh, well, we need to actually monitor this beyond are we up. You know, we have, you know, 100 servers instead of two servers. So we start, you know, we put in, you know, Nagios or Monit or one of these things. Um, you know, now that we no longer just push to, you know, a uh, Heroku Dino we, need, Dino, we need some way to build this and push this stuff out. You know, because we're all buzzword compliant in this day and age, you know, we do some, you know, Jenkins continuous deployment because someone said it was good and hey, it turns out this actually is a little bit helpful. And so we hack it together with a bunch of shell scripts or Ruby scripts or Perl scripts. Depends upon what you know. You know, so if we have a Rails shop, you probably know Ruby, so you're hacking it together with Ruby scripts. Um, most of your services are still managed because you don't have time to run them yourself. You don't have time to understand, you know, how to set up a good high availability syslog server. Um, so, you know, you're still using, you know, uh, oh, I took it down. Did I add syslog here? Anyway, this period is crazy rapid growth. Um, 
the people who are doing this are going to become the legends within the company. You know, this is Joe. He's the one who kept us up over Christmas. Um, him alone, because he was the one that was sober after the Christmas party. Um, you know, th this is uh, Sally. She's the one that completely re-implemented, you know, our billing system over the weekend so that we could get this, you know, important partnership with somebody. Um, these are the acts of legend that, you know, it's like, wow, this is crazy. How do people do this? Um, and it, it creates a sort of interesting shadow that will never, ever be escaped from within that product or that company. Because it'll be like, oh, you know, the things that we do here, we will be dealing with forever because we're not gonna have time to change them completely. You're setting precedents, you're establishing the real sort of culture of the company. Um, you know, and at this point also, you know, we were talking about you're in EC2, you have all these deployments, you know, how the heck, are, what are we gonna do with this? We need to start developing internal operational capacity. So we hire a sysadmin, and because we're buzzword compliant, we call him the DevOps team. Um, <laughs> you laugh, it's true, is it not? So, you know, if you're, if you're a DevOps, you can, you know, get a little bit more salary than if you're a sysadmin. You know, if you're a programmer and you want to do some systems administration, you can, you know, call yourself DevOps and not take a salary hit. You know, it's hor horrible, but DevOps is a term that was, it's a useful term because it sort of captures a whole bunch of practices that are really good, but it's a made-up term for sysadmins doing their job correctly. Um, <laughs> what, people are laughing again. <laughs> so, um, do I have, what's my pace? I have time. No, I'll go into this one later. Um, so, if we look at sort of the state of what's going on right now, you know, we've moved on to EC2. We have conceptually our own servers. We probably haven't bought hardware. Some people will buy hardware, but it's not actually cheaper at this stage because your ability to, oh, we need to spin up 20 servers tonight, you can't do if you're buying hardware. And so this is why you're in the cloud, so you can grow really fast. This is what the cloud's good at. Um, more and more work is coming out of the request response cycle, particularly as you go further and further into this growth phase. And work is coming out of that because, you know, you're in Rails. Um, Everyone says Rails doesn't scale. Rails scales fine, but it is slow as shit. Um, Ruby is not a fast language to run in. Scala is not a fast language to run in because you're doing really inefficient things with it, and this is okay and good. But the way you do that is you just take a whole bunch of work, you take it out of the request response cycle, and you do it somewhere else. You are desperately looking for the thing that will let you stay up another two weeks or six months. Your time horizons are no further than that. You know, you're like, oh, uh, let me see. Oh, the, here, look, we have this fancy new database. We'll use that. Oh, okay, that didn't work. Well, we can't, we don't have time to get out of it, so we'll try this other fancy new database for this next scaling problem. Um, and the fancy new database sometimes is SQLite because you can do amazing things when you're in process. You don't have to talk over the network, and it got you through this immediate crisis, but then you have SQLite somewhere on a big web system, and it's ugly as hell. But this is still the right thing to do because you want to ride this growth as fast as you possibly can. Because if you're not growing, you're shrinking. And we'll go into that later. Um, the other thing that's happening is we're actually building some organizational capacity now. Um, you know, we have, you know, people call it different things. You know, they probably call support advocacy or community development now or something like that. Um, you know, the office manager, believe it or not, probably has as much authority as the CTO because she's arranging lunch, and so you get whatever, you know, she gets what she wants. Um, but the most important thing, though, is that we now have two teams, probably. Every single organization seems to split it into, you know, the front-end web people and then the infrastructure people. And this makes no sense, but it's what everyone does, so it's what we talk about. Um, and the, de the DevOps guy is part of the infrastructure people typically today because we don't hire an ops team. We put them as part of engineering because we're DevOps. Um, and this also makes sense. It's the right thing to do. But, you know, I, I mock things that are the right things to do and I mock things that are the wrong things to do. But this division right here is really, really important because it means that you can't move as fast. You know, the magical number earlier was, you know, you have two people, most, working on something. Typically, you have one, per one person working on something. Well, typically, you have no one working on it. Um, 
and then it falls over, so you have one person working on it. But as you go into this, you know, you're growing, you're getting some money, you can hire people, and you have overhead communication. Um, but it's totally disorganized and dysfunctional from any reasonable perspective yet. You know, you might say, oh, we're going to try and do agile, you know, whatever. We're going to try and get through the current crisis. Um, and the teams are by what product they know. Um, and this is all good. But then something happens. And every time I breathe out, it echoes through the room. Is there? OK, can you still hear me? And I can breathe. OK. I don't want to sound like Darth Vader up here. So the thing that happens, this happens to everyone. This happens to, I mean, maybe the only people this didn't happen to was YouTube, because they got bought before it could. But everyone plateaus. You're going like crazy. You're churning, you're churning, you're churning, you're churning. Uh, you're, you know, your error page, because you're down so much, because you're experimenting with so many things, becomes a stuff of legend. And we now have the term fail whale. Um, and then something happens, and it stops. And you hit a plateau. And all the engineers breathe a big sigh of relief because they get to sleep through a weekend. Um, and this might be a year after the growth started. But this is not a good thing. Because um, you're either growing, as I was saying earlier, or you're shrinking. And you might think you're staying flat, but if you had rapid growth, one of two things happened. You either saturated your market, or someone else is taking that growth from you. You know, the market's still growing, so if you're staying flat, you're actually shrinking. And so you go back to adding features because, hey, features, that's, we did something wrong. And features might be uptime, you know, in, in a sense. But what you're doing now is you're trying to say, what do our users need again um, in order to come back, in order to get us onto that fabulous growth curve? But the problem is you still all have those horrible hacks that you put in in order to get through, you know, last Christmas. You have, you know, your 18 databases that you still need to support. You can't add features very quickly because you now have a huge amount of correctly incurred technical debt. Uh-oh. I have disagreement? I'm looking, oh, he disagrees, okay. Oh, come on. It's what? It looks so similar, yeah. So I, I'm not telling you what you should do. I'm telling you what, you know, the, you know, so I have, you know, been through two startups, you know, to some point along this curve. I've advised several others, and I have tons of friends everywhere. I'm talking about what actually every single company goes through, regardless of what you're doing. And so, yeah, this unfortunately is familiar. Um, and so you need to add features really fast, but you still have all those scaling problems, because your users didn't actually go away. They just stopped coming as much. And so suddenly you start, you know, someone reads a paper saying, oh, we should measure everything and A-B test everything because we're desperate to get the growth back because, you know, without growth, we can't get our next round of funding, we run out of money in a year, and we're all out of jobs and we have to arrange an acquisition or just be out of work. Probably if you had that rapid growth for a period of time, you arrange an acquisition on unfavorable terms. Um, and so you start measuring, and the measuring here is pretty ad hoc. You know, you hire someone, you call them a data scientist if you hire them today, you call them an analytics person if you hired them five years ago, you know, but the job is the same. They stare at the numbers, and they try and figure out what caused an inflection point. And they apply various statistical models to try and do so. Um, and the problem is initially they, they're not you know, this is, you know, a random person who, you know, had the one semester research methods thing in their first year of grad school, and they're trying to say, okay, wait a minute, how does this work again? Is this a valid thing? Is this not valid? I saw a blip. What caused this blip? And you're suddenly sweating the numbers a great deal. But this is a good thing because you need to be able to measure. Previously, you knew you were growing because you were falling over. The thing which worked yesterday stopped working. Now, well, are we growing? Are we not growing? How does this happen? Um, and this is an amazingly frustrating period of time because all of your best engineers, all of the best you know, folks that can have any strong analytical ability are sitting there with GNU Plotter R trying to understand why the feature they released last week, did it change, did it not change, what are users doing? Um, but, you know, we're talking about we're adding features, and trying to analyze this isn't adding features. And so, 
we, we go back, we still have this huge mess of a system. And every single company in the world has this huge mess of a system at this point in their life. And all they're going to do is make it worse. Um, because as they're adding features, they go back to this original one. This is the user interface, basically. And we all know that's what the users care about. And so we've been worrying about scale, 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 scale. Uh, OK, hold on. The users aren't using it anymore. Let's experiment here. Let's make it faster here. Let's add this feature. Let's add that feature. You know, we've been going for three years now. Our UI is starting to look dated, so we have to make it flat now instead of curvy. Um, you know, there's, there's fashion trends in what an application should do just as much. But, you know, the, the entire life cycle of the company now has been churning features as fast as possible, churning scale as fast as possible. And, wow, well, let's hack in this. Let's hack in that. And you have to do this. Doing something else, you're wasting time. Uh, one of the absolute best engineers I've ever worked with. Uh, he built a bunch of stuff in Amazon Web Services. You know, he was on the EC2 team. He went on to do some other things there. We hired him in to you know, help us deal with a lot of the growth when your Ning was going through that you know, huge inflection. You know, he then left after a while and started his own company. And um, it was a horrible disaster because he was doing the wrong thing at the wrong time. Um, trying to figure out where that story was going really quickly. It fit in here, but it doesn't now. Anyway, but he said, okay, well, we're going to scale from the beginning, and we're going to make this all nicely distributed. Um, and what he needed to be doing as soon as he hit this was saying, no, 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 no. We're going to hack a bunch of stuff in and not do it correctly. Because the correct thing to do at this point in time is the fastest thing that's going to let you get back on that growth curve, which is get, make the users happy. And so everybody in the world starts building this up and building this up and building this up. And I call it the monorail now. You're going to make up your own nickname for this thing. You know, this is uh, Facebook's PHP application that's, you know, probably about a million lines. This is, you know, Ning's PHP application that's about 300,000 lines. Uh, this is Airbnb's Rails application that I don't know how many lines it is, but they all curse about it because it's this gargantuan thing that they just cram features into. And this is where it really starts to balloon because you don't have time to clean it up right now. You're trying to get your growth back. Any extra time you have is spent trying to clean the service up, you know, so you keep scaling. And you do get to start cleaning up the sort of structure of the system at this point. Um, because, you know, and I pick on React here. React, I think, is a fabulous product. I X'd it out because um, you say, oh, this is the problem. And because it's such a frustrating point in time, you're on a witch hunt for the problem. You're like, oh, well, this thing caused the dip in growth. It must be the technology's fault. And so we yank the technology out, and you replace React with NFS or something like that. Um, and so in a sense, the system is simplified, but it's simplified in a completely ad hoc manner. Um, you're like, oh, this might be the problem. You know, we see you know, the people staring at the goats say that this is you know, causing a blip. We yank it out completely. We fold the functionality into the monorail, and we stare at the goat a little bit longer and hope things change. Um, oh, what's that do? Oh, cool. I found a new button on my remote. So one of the things that becomes very, actually, I think I skipped ahead. OK, I was like, wait a minute, we're not there yet. So the two outcomes from this stage in the company's life and the product's life are you never find growth again and you arrange an acquisition. It will be on unfavorable terms, but it'll keep your investors sound, it'll keep your employees sound, and you'll all breathe a sigh of relief and go work for a company you otherwise wouldn't for a year. Same as before, but slightly better terms. Uh, the good outcome is you figure out what was wrong. You know, was it a product feature? Was it availability? Was it performance? Was it you're in the wrong market? But you figure out what was wrong and you start growing again. Um, and if you manage to hit that and you sustain it, you now you feel like a real company because you feel like you have some control over your fate. Um, and you, you worked it out. We can measure it now. We have you know, our DevOps team. We know what we're doing. We hired product managers. And so you go out and raise money. You hire a fancy VP of engineering. <laughs> and um, you know, he's a little bit older, so he's the VP of engineering. Um, 
you know, you stop jumping up in the air. Now, but the problem is, you know, while you're like, yay, we're growing, life is good again, you still have this big honking pile of crap that is your system. And you're kind of embarrassed by it at this point, but you're growing and life is good and you can hire people and everyone knows who you are. You know, at this point, you know, your parents, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, they've heard of the company other than from you. And so this is nice, you like this. But you have a problem. You know, you have your typical company mess. You know, all of these things that you swore you were going to avoid when you started from scratch that, you know, you worked on, you know, in your previous jobs before you went and started building something from scratch, you've now rebuilt in its entirety and you're the hero who understands it because you built it. And you're hiring like crazy because you can again, because you're growing, because you have money and because you're like, oh, well, we need to actually clean this up. We need to do this, you know, so we'll, you know, add another team, you know. Um, and you wind up in a problem where you have an idealized shape for what your solution should look like, and then you sort of have the shape of the implementation that you have, and you start making trade-offs between them. You know, you have uh, Joe, who was, you know, the guy who heroically reworked the database system over the course of a week in order to do something, <laughs> say, okay, yes, the code is ugly, but the shape of this solution is correct. The solution itself, you know, scales fine. We can shard this 18 ways, we can do whatever. It's a pain to work with, but the thing actually works. And he's right. You need that solution shape, even if the implementation is ugly as hell. And it works, so you're not gonna go and re-implement it. Um, and you have the opposite problem, though, where you have, you know, this really clean implementation of something else, but when you look at how it's implemented, you know, it can't possibly do what you need it to. You know, because you, uh, let's see, I mean, what's something I can pick on in this case? Oh, it's too easy. Um, I wanted to pick on Mongo in this case, but it's too easy. Okay, I will. Uh, you know, you have something that's just super, super easy to des develop with and scale with and get started with, but then you look at it and you're like, wow, you know, this can't possibly not lose data for us as time goes by. Um, and so you have a nice, easy implementation and something that doesn't scale, and you have to start balancing these things out. And the next thing, if you think back to this huge monolithic Rails application with bits of Ruby sticking out here and there for async callbacks, um, you know, I, I was talking about this problem with a friend of mine who actually works on cancer research. Totally different growth pattern than this, by the way, when you're working for the government doing research. And he's like, so you know what this is? This is metastasis. Um, you have this thing that you can't get rid of or you don't get rid of, and so it spreads out and puts its fingers everywhere and starts popping up. And so, you know, your analytics thing calls back into your front end in order to get a piece of data so the business logic works because you don't want to re-implement that business logic somewhere. You know, your API calls back to the web UI, you know, so your API is just a front end that scrapes your back end so that you can get the same behavior. You know, these things start getting their fingers everywhere and you can't get them out. And you have to start killing these things even though they work, even though you don't want to. And the reason for this is that you have to be able to continue to iterate on features and you have to continue to grow. And so this is where it starts to make sense. All these things that you know, you hear about saying, oh, we need to like, actually factor this correctly. You know, we need to measure this. We need to denormalize here and normalize there and start making these judgments on, you know, the proper shape of the solution and the proper shape of the implementation. You know, you, you probably, oh, no, this is 2013. You don't hire anyone and call them an architect. But you now have people that de facto are architects that are trying to understand the shape of the system as a whole because you've been growing furiously on the front end, on the back end, on the organization, you're probably down to one person who actually understands the entire system. And that one person is lying. They don't understand the entire system. They understand what the system looked like two years ago and they understand what they think it should look like, but that's not how it actually works. So in practice, nobody now understands it. And this is normal and this is okay. But you have to deal with it. So you start documenting things. You start, you know, taking testing more seriously. Because, you know, testing at this point has been, oh, well, you know, uh, 
you know, Lily tests pretty rigorously. She has like 80% code coverage, but Brian just hacks stuff together and tests it in production. You know, did traffic go down? No, then it works. I mean, come on, traffic would go down if it didn't work. Um, I'm not kidding, like I know people, like this is how they test. And these are people whose products most people in this room use every day. Um, and so you start saying, okay, this thing, we're gonna kill it. It works, we're gonna kill it. This is, uh, we're gonna build this to get us through the next six months and then we're gonna kill it. Because you're growing again, you have all those growing pains, but you need to get, and so the apoptosis is the process by which things are designed to die. You know, a perfectly healthy thing, you're going to replace it. You know, we know we're going to, you know, add these features, add these features, add these features, get us through this, because we have this other thing skimming along that's gonna kill this off and replace it, but you have to have that duplication of work. Now, the other problem you have now is you have this big pile, you know, so you sort of have that on the technical front. You know, when you start looking at sort of the technical operations front, you still probably have that pile of Ruby scripts that you wrote during your first growth phase, refactored now a little bit, slightly less painful, but your operational capacity is increasingly manual. You just have to magically know that you start these servers before those servers. You know, you just have to magically know that, you know, we have to use this AMI rather than that AMI for this service. Um, and that starts to get increasingly ugly because remember, nobody actually understands the whole system now. And so you have the wiki sprawl where you find a page and it's like, oh, it says to do this. Oh, but this page is nine months old. Is this still accurate? And you start hunting around, you know, for one of the heroes that remembers. And they're like, I don't know, try. If it falls over, it doesn't work. Um, and so, but it's actually slightly worse because you don't, don't just have a thousand servers. You have 50 different things that are running on these servers and it boggles your mind. You're like, wait a minute. We run a gift list. It talks to Facebook to find our friends. It has a little bit of, you know, sort of Hadoopy magic to try and guess what gift you want to run. How do we have 50 different things that we're deploying? Well, remember all those crazy experiments? They're still there. You didn't kill them. Um, you know, one of those components is a quarter million lines of Ruby. Half of the implementations of things in it are in method missing because it's based on Rails. And that's what people do. Um, and half the company has never seen it before. You know, when you're talking about, oh great, we can hire people to fix this, you know, you're hiring them in, you know, who here has joined a code base, you know, yay, shiny company, awesome growth, I'm gonna help you see the code base and you just cry on your first day. Yeah, not many people, you're just not admitting to it, or you haven't ever joined a company at this point in the company. You know, so, Everyone coming in, you're like, yay, we have these people, and they're like, yay, I'm gonna join this awesome high growth startup, things are awesome, everyone knows this, we're featured in Fast Company on the front page, and the code is a disaster. And so the solution, though, is because you can't shrink the company at this point, you need these people to keep up with what you're doing, you need to work on features and removing scaling limitations at the same time, you need to build out that analytics team, and now all of a sudden you're like, wow, you know, measuring the performance and measuring what's happening, we can also do business analytics. Um, you just keep adding people and adding, so you start caring about process. And this is where you hire program managers or agile coaches or whatever the current term for the people that actually care about how things get done as their full-time job. Um, and this is a hard thing to sort of come to terms with. You know, because, I mean, I go in and I just fix this thing. I hack it up, I put it together, but now someone's telling me that I have to, you know, you know, have two different people code review it, one person from my team, one te person from somebody else's team. In order to get it deployed to production, I have to file a ticket, it has to, you know, stage out slowly. I just wanna go out and put this thing there and make it work, and you can't do this. And you can't do this because nobody understands how everything works, and there's a whole bunch of people trying to figure out how to work with that. But you still need to add features, and you still need to remove scaling limits, and this is, a fun and stressful time. And it's not fun and stressful technically because the scaling limits you're removing, as we've been talking about, are the organizational scaling limits. You know, all of these things, you know, when you added the teams, you know, your teams at this point are a bit of a mess. All the pain at this point in the company, 
you know, you have all the technical pain you had previously, but the main thing you're working around is actually the organizational growing pains. Um, you know, and by the time you've gotten to this point, though, you are a fairly mature company. You know, things are progressing relatively well. I forgot to start the timer, so I have no much time I have left, so I'm kind of guessing on timing. Um, you know, but you're, you know, and what you're doing, though, is who here is familiar with Conway's Law? No one here knows Conway's Law? Okay, so Conway's Law states that the shape of your technical system is going to grow to look like the shape of the communications within the organization building it. You know, so if you have four teams and these two teams don't talk to each other, their components also aren't going to talk to each other. You know, if you have a layer of project managers that control all communication, you're gonna have, you know, a system, like a message bus in your system that controls all communication because you, it, you have to. The shape that people actually look at things um, and the way that you think about the company and the system are so closely intertwined. Um, but there's a flip side to this, which is if you're really sharp, you can actually hack the shape of the company by the shape of the system. Um, and it's not really one driving the other. Two are absolutely intertwined. So, you know, if we look at the system, you know, so at this point in the you know, phase of the company, you've got lots and lots of different things. You have half a dozen logical teams. They're pretty ad hoc. Mostly what you, you know, what you hack on is controlled by who wrote it. You know, so the company might be organized into four teams of engineers, but here are the actual sort of breakdowns of the things that change related to each other and who owns them. And so you start saying, this is where all of these service-oriented things, putting APIs between things, starts to make sense. Um, because you have these different teams, and you're actually trying to structure this stuff so that you can build it effectively. You are, in fact, structuring the organization in order to build the application the way that you want to build the application. This is Conway's law being applied. And so when you come into this, the sort of organizational ownership of different components is as ad hoc as, you know, the sort of monorail code base. Um, and you start hacking the shape of the organization. You know, so the first attempt, you know, again, falls out totally by what people know. Oh, users see this stuff, so the front end team has this. You know, uh, someone knows, you know, the way around solar, so all of that stuff goes in here. Um, and they talk to each other via services. And then all, but you know, it turns out that, you know, this first attempt doesn't work and you reorganize it and you reorganize it. And you know, you have a different classification. Oh, someone's telling me, 15 minutes left and five minutes for Q&A, awesome. Um, optimizing what I have left, okay. So what we have now is a company of 150 people, a product and uh, operations and engineering organization of about half of that, you know, 70 or 80 people, split into half a dozen teams. Uh, you know, you, you've admitted that, you know, your DevOps team is operations now because you've hired someone who's done this before and they call it operations. And so you now have your VP of operations, your VP engineering, um, you know, director of analytics, whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, Jeff Bezos is famous, you know, you will make everything exposed by an API, you will make everything metered between each other starts to make sense. You know, you now, how things talk to each other, how APIs are evolved, how versioning works, become serious first class concerns. Um, You've had something called, you know, an architectural council or principals meeting, you know, where the senior people in the company get together and argue about this, you know, incredibly and piss off everyone trying to get their work done because they're like, well, I can just put this into the monorail because, you know, it never goes away, you know. And they're like, no, you can't put this into the monorail because, you know, it's logic that really belongs over to sort of the payment and accounting system. You know, you can't just cram it in there. And they're like, well, if I cram it in there, I'll be done tomorrow. If I build some API and negotiate with this other team, I'll be done in two weeks. Which one do you want? 
and they say, no, it's two weeks. And they're right. Because they've paid the price of this huge disorganization and they're trying desperately to bring it back into some semblance of order. And it's just really trying to get a semblance of order. And parts of the system, um, typically the middle-aged parts that are critically important, so not the oldest parts, that's the monorail, not the newest parts because that's, you know, something shiny, but the middle-aged parts that have been important and hacked on and hacked on and hacked on start to actually look good. Um, and you start getting sort of like internal, you know, tech talks about how did we accomplish this. Um, and you're acting like a larger company now, but you're not. You're just starting to act that way. Now, <clears throat> this is where me speaking from experience needs to stop. And now I start talking from secondhand knowledge. Because, uh, you know, anyone that's achieved total market saturation, I've never been in that company yet. So I can't tell you firsthand. But the next plateau that you hit when you go through this, you know, if you're talking like consumer internet, you're now carrying 2% of the traffic of the internet if you picked a good enough market. Uh, if you didn't pick a big enough market, you're not carrying that much and you never actually progress a lot further. Um, and I say 2% of the traffic of the internet because if you look at the super high growth companies, you know, consumer internet stuff in the last decade, they plateau at between one and 2% of the traffic, of the, which is huge. If you think about one or 2% of the traffic of the internet, and then you start growing very slowly for those little chunks after that. You know, so YouTube got to 1% and they got bought. You know, they got there so fast it was insane. Um, you know, uh, Yahoo, different properties on there got there. But anyway, the, the attributes of the organization you're in now, you actually, you have, you have either been bought or IPO'd by someone that knows how to run a big company. And the problems you're facing become all those big company problems. And so everyone in this room leaves and starts over. I mean, I'll be serious. I mean, it's may maybe not. Maybe, you know, this is atypical. I don't actually know this conference that well. But very few people at this point, this is now boring. This is now run by middle management. The technical problems are the continued evolution of what you did. And so you're like, let me pick something where I can work fast again. Let me get back into that product cycle going again. Because this is a hell of a lot more fun, and these are the people that are lionized. You know, all of these people, you know, are now rich and funding other companies, um, or doing it again, but you know, they're doing it with zero stress, so they probably won't do it as successfully. Some will. Um, so because I have to be able to, you know, as promised, question time, the things I want to take away from this is that you're going to hear this is the right way to do something. And keep in mind, this is the right way to do something at this point in time with these things being applied to it. Because you're going to hear in the next session, this is the other right way to do it, and they're not going to agree. And the point is that it is absolutely right for where that person came from. You need to make sure that when you're solving a problem, you're actually solving today's problem. This is where the story of the brilliant guy who worked on AWS was supposed to come in. You know. So he went, he knew how to solve scaling problems like mad. He was crazy. He'd built massively successful products. But when he goes in to start his own company, he's like, well, it's going to grow this way. It's going to shard this way. So, you know, we're going to use Rails, except we're not going to use Active Record. We're going to put this, you know, sort of sharding persistence layer behind. And he spent all of his time building this nice persistence layer for something with 50 users. And it was an absolute huge waste of time. And he just didn't see this because he knew that problem was going to come up. He was solving the wrong problem, or he was solving a problem the right way at the wrong time. But when you're solving, you know, all the problems that you need to do right now, even if it's gross, you know, you're like, well, I have to solve this later. What is my heuristic for the right way to do it? And the idea is that you don't, you, if you know, if, you, if you've done this before, you know, if you talk to people who have, you have an idea of the shape of your eventual solution, you know, so you just want to not block it. You know, so if you're trying to get from point A to point B, sure, you can go in a straight line. But if your heuristic is you don't want to bend back towards A, you can go up, down, you can go all around, you can do all kinds of crazy things, but just don't work backwards is a useful heuristic. 
And then finally, you need to be able to recognize biases. You know, every single one of us had our formative years at one of these stages at a company. You know, I have a strong bias towards just hack the thing into shape, put it out there, and then twiddle it, twiddle it, twiddle it. You know, you know, my formative years were in sort of that high growth part of a thing. Uh, you know, Sonny's, the guy I was talking about, and you know, formative years, where you know, during the let's, you know, that second massive growth phase for Amazon Web Services. Um, other people, you know, you have a bias like, oh, <clears throat> you know, I came in during that rapid organizational growth. I have to write really maintainable code so that the people coming in can understand it. You know, it has to be perfectly factored all the time. And, you know, as you do more, as you grow more, as you work through more things where the priorities are different, you'll be able to say, oh, this is the right thing right now, but you're still always under pressure going to fall back to some particular bias. And you need to recognize what your bias is and what the bias of the people around you is, what the biases of the people around you are. Sorry, as the native English speaker, I still mess it up. Um, and work with that because they're, they're going to be right, they're going to be wrong at different points in time. And you, know, you need to be able to guide and help people in doing what's right, right then. And who's the right person for leading a project is gonna change completely over time. And the one who was really slow and annoying a year ago is gonna be absolutely the right person, not because they've grown or changed, but because the way they work is fundamentally different. Okay, questions? I had a whole bunch of people promise me they would ask questions. Because I, I was warned that you know, people tend to be shy and not ask questions. So. Oh, oh, I think somebody got a microphone ahead of you. I apologize. Great, great talk, thanks. Oh. So uh, I, I want to go back to the uh, early moments of the startup. So um, to the moment when you have uh, running on something like Heroku, mm -hmm. and then you decide to go to, let's say, EC2, right? So mm -hmm. uh, my question is, um, how do you decide when to do this step, right? What, okay. what are the heuristics for, for doing this? And how do you deal with all the extra work you have to do then? Because you have to deal with updates, security, yep. monitoring, etc. And that, you know, something okay. like Heroku solves for you. Yeah, so the, the question that I hear you ask about is, you know, you go from this, you know, everything's on Heroku, everything is fitting in this model. How do you know it's time to switch off of it? And how do you actually do that? Am I getting your question right? Okay. So, uh, let's see. I'll give a consultant answer to start with. It depends. Now, it depends is useless, so I'll try to give a real answer. You know it's time to switch off when it's too expensive, first off, is one thing that's a large driver. But that's not usually the one, because if you're in that growth again, um, Expense isn't your main problem because you have money, you can raise money. Um, it's when you can't do what you need to do. So the, you know, to take Heroku, you know, we'll roll with a very concrete example. You know, you're running Rails on Heroku. You know, the things which usually force people off are we can no longer afford 15 minutes of downtime to perform an update. You know, we want to switch to a continuous delivery model and measure more carefully, so we're going to be doing 15 updates a day. And so, you know, when you do a Heroku push, it spins down your servers, deploys the code, spins up your servers, and it takes too long. That's often what causes that. Um, the second one is you need to start taking advantage of things, because remember, your scale, you're, you're falling over. You go to their largest Postgres instance, and it can't do what you need. So you're like, well, of course we have to put Cassandra in, because Cassandra magically scales. It came out of Facebook, and Facebook's big. Um, even though they barely use it. Um, and you look at, you know, oh, well, Datastack provides Cassandra as a service on Heroku, and oh my God, it costs more than everything else in the company combined. Um, or we implement our own thing, and you basically start saying, okay, well, we have to put more and more stuff outside of Heroku. And so the transition actually starts with Heroku runs in US East 1. It runs out of uh, Virginia on Amazon. And so you can spin up your own thing on EC2 in the same region on Amazon. 
and you do that. That's the first thing that you do. You're like, oh, cool, I add the Heroku security group, and now I can spin up my own thing. And so you spin up your thing, and you're like, oh, well, we're managing this, and we have the Heroku stuff. And gradually, you have more and more of this, and you start building up that operational capacity on the this. And you're like, what are we really getting out of Heroku other than a very large bill? It's awfully convenient, but you know, there's other tools out there that make it convenient, and we can start doing the nice sort of unicorn, no downtime deploys. Um, and it turns out that we want to tune things differently. We want to put these particular libraries. We want to have some stuff that is really inconvenient to do with the build pack. And it's, it comes, usually the typical path off Heroku is you spin up stuff in US East 1, and you just start gradually shifting stuff over more and more until there's nothing left there. And they're, of course, trying to keep you, because at this point, you're high growth and paying them a lot of money, and they want you. Um, that's the most common way. There's other ways. The other thing, though, you'll, you'll want to find, the other thing that drives you off is you don't want to be in US East 1. Because um, that's the first place that Amazon always deploys things to. It's the largest. It's the one that falls over all the time. Typically, when you're like, oh, a huge Amazon outage. Everything got taken down. It's just US East 1. And so the other thing that drives people out is just availability. You know, we just had you know, two days of downtime because of this you know, intermittent EBS failure you know, affecting US East 1, which took Heroku down. Oops. And so you start shifting out onto US East 1, but then you start shifting over to another, avail um, another region as soon as you're transitioned over. Is that answering, does that answer your question? Or start to? Yes? Awesome. Uh, this nice lady is picking who's going to get to ask the question. I'll try to prompt you to be next. Hi. Uh, Hi. You're right to recognize that large pieces of technology are rather collaboration and organization, you know, oriented. So once you recognize that some of those are not um, good enough anymore, mm -hmm. you have to actually move over to another system. and. What I find difficult is to actually make sure that you kill the system that you're moving away from. So how do you uh, actually do that? How do you ensure okay. that you actually kill the old system? Right, so the, the, that's a very good question. So try and phrase it. You know, so you, know, you build something and you have it. How do you actually make sure that you kill the thing that you're moving away from? And I'm going to say, unfortunately, the usual answer is you don't. You never actually manage to kill it. This thing lingers for the rest of the lifetime of the entire company. Um, I think actually Paul, who's talking in an hour or so, has a lot to say about that kind of thing. Um, if you want to make sure you actually kill it, you know, you're like, I don't care how much this hurts, we're going to kill this. <sighs> the least bad way is you take some, so typically the thing you want to kill is the monorail. Um, it is whatever is rendering your user interface that has all that initial business logic. You take some slice of it and you peel it out. Hold on, let's see here. I have a diagram where I, talk, where I actually do a little bit of that. You peel a little bit out. Okay. And you have, you know, feature rail and feature rail too, where you typically will take, you know, how is it we want to be doing it? You peel this thing out. You'll, you know, despite the fact like, oh, we don't want to use Rails anymore, we want to use Play uh, because we want to use Akka because it magically scales. It's one of those silver bullets that, you know, I read a white paper and says that if we use this, we'll be able to scale and we won't have any problems, um, which might be true. It isn't, but it might be. Um, you say, okay, you peel this out and you put it there. But the problem is this is the UI, so now you have to implement the same UI in two different systems. And so you implement a, te a templating system or you, know, you do something so you can use the same templates. Uh, mustache came out of this, um, or a lot of the mustache utilization. And so you pull part of it out, and then you move it over. And then you pull another part out, and you move it over. Um, and you start having different components rendering different parts of the system. Very few companies ever do this because it becomes really hard to coordinate this across teams. You know, your designers start freaking out because they can't make simple changes. Your engineers start freaking out because they have to get, you know, pixel perfection on things. Um, but some do. Amazon famously did this. Um, you know, um, let's see, Facebook hasn't. 
I presume, well, Google has specifically different products. You know, they stopped having that unified interface. Um, and so that, that's the hardest one to do, and it's the one that people most often want to do, is the thing rendering that user interface. Now, if you have a service, you know, something that just exposes an API, then it gets a little bit easier, because APIs typically are less invasive than user interfaces, less nuanced. Um, and you implement it again, and you transition over what you can. But you can have this one little thing that you can't transition, because the semantics aren't identical. And so this thing's gonna linger and linger and linger for a couple of years. Um, and then eventually you'll just decide that little bit of functionality isn't worth maintaining these servers for, and you kill that functionality. Um, those are the, the typical cases. I, there's no good answer for this, because the typical answer is you don't. You just add. Systems accrete. Okay, I promised the gentleman over here I would try to get to him, even though I think we have, we have 30 seconds. I'm guessing. I have a timer, but I didn't start it at the right time. So there's a gentleman, oh, I have four minutes. We have lots of time. Um, okay, um, so uh, you said a lot about uh, duplicating stuff uh, during uh, the, the process of adding uh, scalability. Mm -hmm. um, what would be your advice uh, how to do that? Do you do it in a, uh, in, a, uh, in a layer like in Rails that you duplicate your data stores or do you have a uh, ETL uh, mm -hmm. for, for migrating the data mm -hmm. on triggers or, or, or any other um, technique that might be useful and easy to implement? Okay, uh, so the question is, you know, you talk about duplicating things, you know, as you implement functionality, you know, how do you actually migrate or replace something? You know, I, I'm trying to actually completely understand your question. Are you talking about, like, you know, the, the typical, where you have this, like, Cambrian explosion of data storage technologies, or? Okay. Yep. Okay. Okay, so how, how do you implement it? So you're trying to replace a component with something that uses a new model. You know, how do you do this in a way that is unlikely to fail? <sighs> it depends. <laughs> um, okay, so let's pick it. So the, the answer actually really is it depends. Um, early on in the company, you implement it, you take an eight hour downtime where you ETL everything and you bring up the new one and you have a, a night with no sleep. And this is okay because all of your customers are in the same time zone as you and they don't notice that you're down overnight or they're used to it because you're failing all the time. Now, that, that's the cheap answer. Now, later on, um, that's not an acceptable answer because you can't take that. And you're saying, okay, we want to replace you know, our primary, you know, storage layer with, you know, we, we have this thing, you know, while we were growing really, really fast where we decided since we can't guess what the queries are gonna be, we're going to denormalize everything onto Lucene um, and always query against Lucene and then just have a key value store behind. Um, and it turns out this also, you know, has horrible, horrible scaling characteristics, but it got you past the problem. So now you need to migrate onto something rational. How do you do this? The, one of the least painful ways that I've found to do this is as you have a large system, you're going to typically vertically partition it. You're going to shard the entire system into what eBay calls swim lanes, other people call bulkheads, but basically totally isolated sections of the system. And you're going to take one of these sections of the system that is newer and slightly less manky in terms of the number of users on it, and you're going to migrate it to the new technology. And you're gonna bring it up and it's gonna fall over and be horrible and you're gonna discover all kinds of bugs. You know, but you can bring it up, you, know, you bring up this new shard on the new technology that has a few users and it grows and you work out the problems there. And once it actually works, and this might be six months later, but once this shard is working correctly, you know, and it might be the shard for internal users or beta testers or something, You'll then say, okay, how do we migrate, you know, an entity root at a time, you know, by type from one to the other? So when you have, you know, the sharded system, one of the things you very quickly wind up developing is the ability to take, 
you know, whatever the root of my sharding is, move it from here to there. And you ETL it one entity root at a time. You know, so in the Ning case, you know, our primary sharding root, uh, key was the social network. So in Ning, basically, we run social networks for things like a conference. If we all wanted to have a sort of Facebook-like experience private for the people here, you'd use something like Ning, you know, or a church, or a sports club, or whatever, a band. And so we would say, okay, well, we're gonna take one at a time, we're gonna ETL it over to the new thing, and we're gonna migrate them that way. And so a particular entity route will have 30 seconds or a minute of downtime, or limited downtime where you know, it's still readable but not writable. And you gradually do that. And your transitions onto new systems sometimes take a very, very long time because you're doing it very fine-grained. But that's the main way that you do, that's, well, that's one main way. That's the main way that we do it um, in order to allow for that. Um, and I am completely out of time at this point. As some said one minute and I'm done. So I'd be happy to talk about it. Like if you have a specific case, I'd be very happy to talk about ways of doing that. Um, but the question changes, you know, depending upon the size, age, relative prioritization. It depends on where the company is and where the system is. Thank you very much, everyone.